I remember saving every penny I could find. <laughs> Berkshire County was one of many counties in Massachusetts. Had a lot of towns. I lived in two of them, but not at the same time. <laughs> Sheffield and Stockbridge. There was a sawmill, a, a cider works, a tannery, and a grist mill. When the ironworks was up and running, I could always tell what time of day it was by the sound of the clanging and the smell from the fountain. <laughs> mm. I can almost hear the children I deliver. I'll never get tired of hearing the sound of a baby crying for the first time. I liken it to church bells ringing or anything pleasing to the ear. Mother and baby are fine, so then my work is done. Living is the hard part. <laughs> I'm going to miss those bells. When a baby is born, it has so much hope in its eyes, a hope they don't even know. <laughs> Teach yourself hope, even in the worst of circumstances. That's what I used to tell myself, not that anybody cared to hear my thought. But I always had hope. That's what got me by most days. <laughs> I knew that if I hoped for a home and I saved my money, I'd have my own one day. But I hope for breathing first. Funny thing about the light. No matter how you catch it, whether it's in a glass or someone else's eyes or even a piece of jewelry, it's alive and free. <laughs> Don't cost you nothing to look at it and you can't punish it for going away at night. But the next day, it comes back like it has a job to do, and it does. At night when you can't see the light, it's off being alive and free somewhere else. <laughs> I wondered if I would ever be free. I don't know when, but I know one day I want to get closer to the light. I don't remember how old I was when I was given to the Ashleys, but I do know I was a child. <laughs> Nothing but the finest silk. Mistress Ashley, Mistress Hannah Ashley, as she demanded, wanted the grounds and the stable looked after, and she wanted a few chickens for dinner. Yes, mistress, uh, Mr. Ashley is having a gathering. He want a few chickens for supper, uh, only a few. Well, they would want dinner, mistress. Do you know how hard it is to catch and kill chickens and pluck and feathers with one good arm? I needed Lizzie's help for that. Oh, there was so much to do before the colonel got home. I had to get started before Hannah opened that bell clapper of a mouth of hers. <laughs> Lizzie kept laughing at what I said. <laughs> I started laughing, too. We could barely keep ourselves from being discovered by Hannah. <laughs> I haven't laughed like that in a long time. <laughs> On this particular day, the Ashley household was filled with chatter, a few men, food, and laughter. I heard Hannah laughing with her husband and the rest of the men. I recognized them from their visits from before. There was a, a Deacon Smith, he always comes by, um, Captain Austin, Captain Dewey, and Mr. Theodore Sedgwick. I would enter and exit the room, making as little noise as possible so I wouldn't be noticed. After everyone finished, I'd clean up and put everything away. I couldn't wait to leave. I was halfway home when I realized I had one more thing to do. My heart was racing. I ran back to the house before Hannah ever noticed. She probably would have started yelling. Now this time, the men were in the parlor. I heard them before I walked in, but they sounded different this time. It sounded like they had something to celebrate. One by one, I watched as each of them signed a piece of paper that the colonel had on the table. He took the paper, stood up, 
and toasted the rest of the room, and then he proceeded to read. It said, Mankind in a state of nature are equal, free, and independent of each other, and have the right to the undisturbed enjoyment of their lives, their liberty, and property. I was silent for a moment. I didn't know what to say. I kept hearing in my head, mankind was free and independent of each other, but I wasn't free. I'm equal, and I had the right to defend my freedom. I couldn't move, and I didn't speak. Hannah caught me in the kitchen. She said, what are you still doing here? I couldn't say a word. Hannah's husband, John Ashley, wasn't like her at all. He was a peaceable master, but a master just the same. Mm. I couldn't live with myself if I let her hit that child. She would have killed her for sure. Mistress hit bone, but she didn't touch a hair on that child's head, and that's all that mattered to me. I couldn't stay there. I had to leave. Have you ever been hit with a hot iron shovel? Ah! That was Hannah. Uh, she sounded different on this day. I had Lizzie with me. We were baking bread for the Ashleys. Lizzie always got hungry, so she would steal a little bit of the bread dough to save it for later in the afternoon. That's when Mistress came in to see what we were doing, and that's when I heard that scream. Then she yelled, don't you look at me like that, and I saw what you did. She was yelling at that child. I dropped everything, and I ran over to Lizzie and started to leave. I told her not to bother nothing when we were together working in the house, but she knew she'd get hungry later. Then I saw it. Bit of bread dough sitting on the table she was trying to hide from Hannah. She told her she'd put it back, but mistress cursed her for being in the house. I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed Lizzie and started to leave. That's when she accused me of trying to teach her how to steal food. I never stole nothing a day in my life. She talked about how awful I was and that she would sell me to another family. And then she went over and grabbed the shovel out the fireplace and held it above her head. That shovel was hot. I couldn't let her hit that child. I said, Mistress, no! Mistress hit bone, but she didn't hit Lizzie. And I told you before, that's all that I cared about. The shovel came down on me like an ax on damn wood. And a pain I never felt before. I got the scar to prove it. It's like the pain went through my body, walked away, and came back to move in. I grabbed Lizzie with my good arm, and we sailed out of the house back to my room. I ripped the sheet off the bed and ripped it to strips, and that sheet served its purpose, too. Laid on the floor and passed out. When I woke up, I finally got up enough nerve to look at my arm. I wrapped it so fast I didn't know what to expect. Didn't know how bad it was. My makeshift bandage stuck to my arm like varnish on wood. And at that moment, peeling away at it slowly, was the best thing for me to do. Lizzie helped me clean it. I tore the sheet into strips and wrapped it again. It felt better, but I knew I wasn't going to keep it bound like this day after day. It reminded me of not being free. Lizzie said I should keep it on. 
<laughs> Imagine that, a child no one better than me. If I wanted to take it off, I would. I reached for my pocketbook and grabbed my little bag of coins. <laughs> it was nothing much. Only change I'd been saving over the years. <laughs> when you have years to wait, it's funny how it adds up so fast. I spread the coins on the bed. Lizzie was worried that we'd be discovered by Hannah again, and I didn't want to have to worry about that. Lizzie took her time inspecting each coin like it had a secret. <laughs> I'm getting closer. Closer to what? Never you mind. <laughs> Hannah called for me to come back to the kitchen to clean up the mess that Lizzie made. She handed me the shovel and told me to sweep the ashes back into the fireplace. I wiped it clean and I put it back. I knew the weight would be great if I tried to run. It was business as usual at the Ashleys. I was cleaning and Hannah was dealing out her daily dose of noise when all of a sudden she got quiet. When she came into the room where I was, she didn't say a word. Not like any other day, I guess, but she had a funny look in her eye, a mischievous look. I didn't even look up at her. I just kept on with my broom. When she came over to where I was, she kicked the pile of trash. I swept it back into a pile again, and she didn't like that. You missed the spot. I swept another pile and she kicked the trash again. She said, you missed it again. She threatened to replace me. I said, no, mistress, you don't have to do that. Good. I didn't think so. Mr. Ashley was on his way home and everything needed to be clean and spotless on his arrival. He had been gone for weeks and was bringing company with him. Hannah wanted everything just right for the house. She noticed that I had the bandage off my arm. She said, cover that up. I said, mistress, I'd rather keep it off to give it some air. She said, it's hideous. You will cover it up or you can leave. She always joked about me never coming back, but where would I go? Several years this went on. In my mind, I kept hearing those words I heard in the house, equal, free, and independent. One day I had enough. I left. And that was all right by me. I took off and I ran as far as I could. I looked for Mr. Sedgwick. He was a lawyer and he was well respected in town. After every time Mr. Sedgwick came to the house, I would watch him as he went down the road. I would follow him until his carriage was out of sight. I knew that I could speak to him if I just knew where his office was located. One day I stopped watching and I took a walk to see where he worked. I saw him go into the building. I got up the nerve to go in. Mr. Sedgwick, I said. I thought he was going to ignore me, but you know what he said? Yes, Bet. Did you really mean that? Did I really mean what? Did you really mean that we are free, equal, and independent of one another? That's what the Colonel, Colonel Ashley read at the house a few years ago. I meant it because I wrote it. Well, Mr. Sedgwick, I was born free and equal, and I want to sue Mr. and Mrs. Ashley. I'm not free there or any other place I go. I could see the pause in his face. I could tell he was 
Kingdom Hall. After that, it wasn't hard to get him to help me. Not only did he represent me, but he brought Brahm along too. Brahm was enslaved to the Ashley son-in-law. The day finally came. August 21st, 1781. Me and Brahm, we didn't know what to expect. I'd never been in anybody's courtroom before and I didn't know what to wear. I wore the nicest thing I could find. That's what Brahm said. Who he had the right idea too. I wore the dress that my father gave me. When we got there, we were greeted by Mr. Cedric. He, he was wearing a, a, a black waistcoat and breeches to match. We didn't say much. It wasn't much to say. All I know is Mr. Cedric was trying to help us, and that's all that mattered to me. From time to time, I'd look over at Brahm to see if he was still alive. <laughs> he was barely. He thought that coming this far and having to go back was more demanding on the nerves than the verdict itself. And don't think I wasn't a nervous wreck, too. When we got to the courthouse, Mr. Cedric showed us to our seats. The Ashley's lawyers presented their case against Brahm and me, and then Mr. Cedric presented our case to the judge. If it didn't work out, who knows what the Ashley's would have done to us. It didn't take long after the facts and papers were presented. The jury went off into a room, and a while later they came back. They ruled in our favor. Mr. Cedric said, I was free. John Ashley tried to appeal the verdict, but his appeal was never heard. There was another freedom case right here in Massachusetts, and soon there were others. Mr. Ashley realized that slavery was unconstitutional and freed his slaves and other fathers. Once, he tried to get me to stay by offering me employment. <laughs> but I was already thinking about myself in another way. And you know what? I was getting closer to the light. My case was heard. My hope was heard. August 21st, 1781 was the greatest day of my life. And I'm sure it was in Brahms, too. When I looked around the room, I realized I was the only woman in the courtroom. The only woman in the courthouse. I felt like there were more eyes looking at me than the ones I could see. Later that day, Brahm asked me, how in the world could I sit still in court? I told him when I was at the Ashley's and I was quiet, I heard the most important thing to us right now. His smile was catching, <laughs> and I realized I was smiling, too, because I was happy, and I was free. I needed a name to fit the person I became. Everyone called me Mum Bet, but my name is Elizabeth Freeman. The Sedgwick's had children. I knew I couldn't stay with the Ashleys anymore. Would you? I went to work for Mr. Cedric and his family. He lived across town, but that didn't matter to me. He always was away for work, and he had an office in the front of his house. I would sometimes hear him preparing for court. I'd like to present two witnesses. One witness will testify that my client is the occupant of the land. Sometimes he would call out to me if it was too quiet in the house. Bet? Bet? Yes? He would come into the room where I was to see if I was there. He was about to call out to me again. I heard him the first time. <laughs> he said, why aren't you outside with the children? I told him dinner wasn't going to fix itself, and besides, 
They know not to go past that first tree. Oh, he offered to take me to the doctor when he saw me rubbing my arm, especially hard one day. I told him there was no need for me to go. He said, how do you know the children won't go past that first tree? I said, keep your eye on them and on that kid. He watched them, and they didn't go past that tree either. In fact, they came running back up the hill towards the house. <laughs> they knew better. <laughs> I believe they did. We taught them well. <laughs> How's Mr. Cedric today? Pamela's the same. Every day, I would fix his food and take it upstairs to her. She liked it when I would come upstairs and spend some time with her. Mr. Cedric hoped she would get better. Pamela Cedric was ill in the mind. After losing three babies, you'd be out of sorts too. Sometimes the troubles of life make you forget what's real and what isn't. Pamela was caught in between. Every day I'd check on her to make sure she had what she needed. I couldn't sit by and watch her go downhill. There was just too much living to do. Remember what I said about hope? Mr. Cedric, when he would come back from a trip, she was the first person he would ask about. How's Mr. Cedric today? She is awake. Is that all? Yes. Did she eat? Yes. Did she say anything? No. All right. As Soon as he'd come back, he was back out again. This time he had to go to Boston. The children were away at school, and I told him I would look after Mr. Cedric. In 1787, there was a terrible uprising in town. In fact, it was so bad that when it ended, it was all over the county and beyond. Daniel Shea's rebels were protesting injustices that were going on. The government wasn't listening to its citizens, and the townspeople weren't exempt from the wrath of Shea's rebels. It was town against farm and merchant against farmer. They broke into the house. They demanded that I give them the key to the cellar. I couldn't do that. There was enough supplies down there to last us six months or more, but they had guns and I didn't. I took them down to the cellar, but I distracted them with a spell. One man drank a bottle and then complained at how bitter it was. Another one said, do you have anything better? I said, no, I don't. Then they proceeded to turn over everything they could find until, until they came to a locked chest. That chest was mine. It had my treasures in it. They were saying terrible things about me, and all the while they wanted something from me. I said, if you want what's in that chest, you're going to have to break the lock, because I'm not opening it. I don't know what came over them, but they left us alone. So glad the children weren't home. Mr. Sedgwick came home, and he already heard what happened. He was so thankful nothing happened to Pamela or me. He rarely came down to the main part of the house. We were used to that by now. I was with her when she passed away. September 20th, 1807. I told their daughter, Catherine, we must be quiet. Don't you think I'm grieved? Our hair has grown white together. It took everything in me to console the children. I love them and they love me. I decided to move on after Pamela passed away. But I didn't move too far. I purchased land for $75. It came with a small house and a barn and a life that I lived my way. <laughs> I filled it with grandchildren and great-grandchildren in a community of people that looked like me. 
I can come and go as I see fit. No one's in charge of my life. My very own home. Now that's freedom. Catherine asked me what I would do with my own home, and I told her I'd do what I'm doing right now, living, and I couldn't always say it. She said, why? I said, because slavery isn't freedom. And if any time when I was a slave, one minute's freedom was offered to me, and if I had been told that I would die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it to stand one minute in God's earth, a free woman, I would. 